r slash no sleep posted by you slash decorative a gentleman there is a door on the second floor of our house that leads nowhere but something has been knocking my family and i moved into 413 rutherford lane around six months ago it seemed like a nice enough house fairly large with a wide porch and a big backyard i know almost nothing about architecture otherwise i'd try to describe it better but among the houses of our neighborhood ours is distinctive Despite the numerous quirks about the house and the property on which it sits, one feature in particular has persistently drawn my curiosity, a door off of the upstairs hallway that leads to nowhere. You may have seen doors like this before in older homes, a remnant of a balcony that's no longer there or something similar, but this door is different from all the other doors in the house. It's a bit taller and narrower than the rest and in spite of the crooked door frame, its door fits it perfectly. Now, understand. There is a door on the outside of the house to match the inside, but that door looks shorter, more even. Maybe it's just the 15 or so feet between the door and the ground that makes it look that way, but it's still strange. And it locks from the outside. When we moved in, my sister hated the door almost as much as I was fascinated by it. It was next to her bedroom and around a week into living in the house we were all awoken by her scream in the middle of the night. My mom and dad came into the hallway before me but I arrived in time to hear her ranting about hearing a knock from the other side of the door. My dad assured her that it was nothing, a bad dream or, possibly a bird pecking at the wood, but Rachel insisted it was a knock. I wish I had listened, that I had believed her. The nighttime screams continued as the weeks passed and two months ago, my mom and dad convinced me to switch rooms with Rachel on account of me being such a brave older brother. My old room had been bigger, but I got the promise of a new computer out of the exchange, so it was a sacrifice I was willing to make. I didn't hear a knock my first night in the room, but around 10 p.m., I did become aware of an uncomfortable heat and humidity that my old room didn't have. It was almost as though a sort of reverse air conditioner had turned on. I tried to explain it away in my mind, perhaps the old house was as patchwork as the door suggested, the heating uneven. Truthfully, it wasn't creepy, just different. I slept fitfully that night and the next few after, Waking up drenched in sweat as my dad grumbled about home inspections and the costs of repairs. I suppose he might have been relieved a week later when the issue seemed to resolve itself, but that night I heard the knocking too. Honestly, despite Rachel's state of fear over the whole thing, I half expected it to be a light tap, like the kind a branch makes against the window in a storm. Instead, I was awoken from a dead sleep by a loud banging. I remember thinking in that moment that I could figure out what it was. I wasn't exactly scared, startled certainly, but I was more curious than anything else. I jumped out of bed and ran into the hall. Whatever I was expecting to see in the darkness of the hallway as I rounded the corner toward the door, it wasn't my sister. She stood directly in front of it, facing away from me and she was swaying from side to side ever so slightly. Rachel? What are you doing? Something about the way she was breathing made me uneasy, and she didn't look back to me even when she responded. He's been here so long. I had no clue who she meant, but I took a tentative step forward. Thud thud thud. I jumped back as I watched the door frame cough dust into still air. It wasn't a knocking, it was a pounding. A sound that should have definitely woken my light sleeping mother, if not both of my parents, but I heard no stirring afterward. Just the sound of my heartbeat and my sister's even breaths. I was shaking. My sister hadn't reacted in the slightest. She just stood, rooted to the floor, gently swaying with an unnerving fluidity. Rachel? I whispered. I remember my voice trembling as I braced for another step, another wood creaking slam. I stepped. No knock. I stepped again. Silence. Two more steps and I had gotten to Rachel. The steady breaths, the swaying, her eyes were closed. She was, sleeping. He's been here so long. So long. So long. I heard my sister repeating it over and over again. But as I stood next to her, looking at her face, a chill ran down my spine. I heard her, but the movement of her lips didn't match the words they made. I shouted for my mom and dad, but as soon as my voice began to rise. Thud thud thud. The small alcove where the door was situated rattled with the angry slams and as I stood, petrified, I suddenly became aware of the humid heat. It was like the heat I had felt in my new room, but far more oppressive and enveloping. There was a weight to it, a drowsy sort of blanketing weight. I don't remember much of what happened next other than my eyes fluttering and my body sagging. I must have lost consciousness, in fact, I'm sure I did, but before everything went black, I distinctly remember the door knob turning and the door creaking open. 
The next thing I remember was walking down a hallway without the faintest notion of how I had gotten there. I didn't wake up on the floor or anything as normal as that, I was just walking as my awareness slowly grew. I think I was saying something before my autonomous action ceased, though now, I can't recall what. Now, this was not a familiar hallway. I wasn't in my house. I knew I should have been, but in that moment, my memory was fuzzy. I was wearing pajamas, I had no phone and no idea of why I was there. Luckily, the hallway was lit, but by what, I couldn't say. The space was simply diffused with a dim, shifting light, like that caused by a candle, but it had no apparent source. There were no doors that I could see, no windows either, just a cream-colored ceiling and carpet and the walls on either side. The walls were covered with a peculiar wallpaper. I remember looking down at the floor a lot, at my bare feet, because whatever pattern was on that wallpaper was difficult to look at. To this day I couldn't accurately describe it other than to say that it had an odd complexity that gave the impression of something that ought to cause an optical illusion. The hallway itself was narrow, turning abruptly at right angles, with no individual stretch of it being longer than 1 or 200 feet and while there were intersections with other seemingly identical hallways, the geometry of the place didn't make sense. I would start at a four-way intersection, make three right turns and end up at a three-way intersection. If I backtracked, more often than not there would be no intersection at all when I returned to my original spot. None of it made sense and in my shift from confusion to frustration to fear to despair, I was palpably aware of the claustrophobia of the infinite monotony and the unfamiliar regularity. The only things that truly seemed familiar were the humid heat of the place and a phrase that kept repeating in my mind. He's been there so long. Occasionally, I would glance forward at the wallpaper and swear that the patterns formed the words in slithering, twisted letters. He's been there so long. But then the words would go, fading into maddening obscurity as I continued staring. I can't tell you how long I wandered those hallways. Days I think. Without a phone or a view of the outside, there was no way to judge the passage of time. I did grow hungry, but water wasn't an issue as the humidity was so great that the walls ran with condensation and I could suck a mouthful out of the wet carpet when I was desperate. More than anything, the uncertainty and the isolation were the hardest parts. At some point though, I started to get the feeling that I was being followed. Perhaps it was the loneliness, I reason, even then trying to apply rationality to circumstances that clearly had none. The wet squishes of my feet against the floor would stop when I did, but more would follow for a step or two. Squish squish stop, squish. Now and then, they would skitter behind me. I would hear their quick approach only to turn and see nothing there but the wallpaper. It was hell. That's what I decided after a time. I would curl up on the sodden floor and sleep, I would wake, walk, and I try to remember the death that must have led me there. Then, at some point during the monotonous routine of mere existence, I turned a corner and saw a door. As I recall, I had almost forgotten that I was looking for a way out, that there was any goal to the endless winding march, but when I saw that door, everything came back into focus. I remembered my sister, my parents, the knocking and pounding, but I remembered, or perhaps realized, something else as well. I stood frozen in place, my trembling hand, inches from the door knob as I urged it to move forward that extra little bit. The footsteps that I had heard following me in those moments when they hurried and I saw nothing as I looked over my shoulder. It wasn't that I couldn't see what was following me. Squish squish. I just could never remember. Fear has a funny way of warping memory. Emphasizing half-truths or embellishments and painting over those moments of genuine terror until something more palatable remains. I remember hearing a steady breath behind me and feeling the words coalesce in my mind as if spoken in a memory I had yet to make. I've been here so long. I don't remember turning the knob or the fall. I broke my wrist and dislocated my shoulder, but I was alive and more importantly, I was free. My dad had no explanation for why the hallway door had come unlocked and even less for how it had managed to lock itself back, but when I returned from the hospital, he already had contractors framing the alcove for a wall to cover it. My parents visited me frequently while I was recovering in the hospital from the fall and the seemingly inexplicable malnourishment, but one thing struck me as odd about their visits. My parents always came together, but never brought my sister. I asked about it on my second day of recovery. Hey dad, why doesn't Rachel ever come to visit with you? He looked up from a book he had brought and knitted his brow. Who's Rachel? I stared at him as he stared back, mirroring my confusion. My, my sister. When I saw the look of concern on my mother's face, my stomach dropped. Who's Rachel? He was serious. My parents urged me to see a neurologist after that exchange. My brain looked normal, 
but I didn't feel normal. I know my sister, I remember her, but apparently I'm the only one who does. My mom confirmed the story about the knocking, but she said it was me who had awoken my parents screaming. They thought it was strange when I insisted on moving into the small room beside the alcove with the door, but ultimately, they relented. Mom said that I had seemed obsessed with being near the door and yet whenever she saw me pass it, she said I seemed terrified. I moved back to my old room when I returned home, my original room, that is. It was vacant. No Rachel, no mementos of her existence, just a collection of boxes and the seeds of a sewing room. It's been difficult to get used to, not having Rachel around, but I had been trying. I had been feeling better, getting better, trying to forget. I had been, until last night. I was walking by the small room next to the now walled off alcove. The door was open and as I passed, a wave of humidity drew my attention. The window in the room was cracked open just a few inches, and in the foggy condensation on the glass, I saw that something had been written as if with a finger. So long. I'll be here. You'll be back.